Thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon for our daily COVID-19 uh, update. Uh, I am, uh, as always, joined by uh, Dr. Nate Smith, uh, Secretary of the Department of Health. And today I'm also uh, joined by Stuart Walton, uh, who will be uh, speaking a little bit later. He is our chairman of our Economic uh, Recovery Task Force, and uh, they had their first meeting today, so I'm looking forward to a report from him. Uh, first, in regard to uh, our case update, uh, yesterday we had 1,923 cases uh, in Arkansas. Uh, that today is up 304 cases. That brings the total to 2,227 cases in the state. Uh, if you break that down, the 304 new cases, 262 of those new cases are out of Cummins, uh, maximum security unit, and 40, that leaves 42 that are outside of Cummins uh, that are the statewide perspective. Um, if you look at hospitalizations, our hospitalizations yesterday were 93. Today they're down seven. We have 86 in the hospital for COVID-19. At the present time, uh, deaths uh, are up one. We now have uh, 43 deaths in Arkansas. Uh, if we'll go to the charts, I just want to uh, go through uh, these uh, uh, in the fashion in which we've done the last uh, couple days. Uh, first, uh, these are the number of new COVID cases by day uh, here in, the, in Arkansas. And as you can see, uh, today, well, this was actually yesterday, which is 420, is the last column. Uh, today's numbers will be entered tomorrow, and you'll see it on the chart. So we're one day behind here, but that last one is 420, and that was reflecting the 300 new cases yesterday. Uh, today it'll be very similar with 304 new cases. Uh, the color differentiation is the difference between those in Cummins or in the prison units versus those that are statewide. If you go to the next chart, you'll see the seven-day rolling average. Uh, this is something that I used yesterday, and this is for all of the cases in Arkansas, seven-day average so that it gives you a good perspective. And so the, uh, the bars are the, uh, the same one you saw a moment ago, the new cases each day, and then the line graph that goes across it is the seven-day rolling average and as you can see the numbers are going up largely reflecting because of the outbreak in the Cummins prison. If you go to the next uh, slide uh, this is the seven-day rolling average uh, excluding the correctional facilities. Uh, you see uh, a different trend line of course that seven-day rolling average which is uh, the line that you see uh, peaking and then coming back down. I thought it'd be interesting today also to see a little bit uh, county by county. We've uh, done a number of counties, but I just wanted to give it for illustrative purposes. And so if we go to the next one, this is Pulaski County, and this is a little bit different because these are positive cases by date of specimen collection uh, versus the time that they're reported. So a little bit of distinction in how this is done. And uh, this is Pulaski County. Uh, and these, of course, over here, you've got to be careful because the top line here is 62 cases. Uh, so the scale is, is different when you see a, a top, uh, a high bar. Uh, and you can see uh, here's 10 as you go across. Uh, these are new cases in Pulaski County. And of course, you can see uh, the very high mark whenever we had, uh, I believe that was the community corrections in which we had a number of cases reported that day, but they were high otherwise as well. And, uh, but since then, it's uh, been on the right trend and direction uh, downward. If you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see another county here in central Arkansas where we had our first case in Jefferson County. Again, uh, this is 12, uh, this is two, and so uh, there are smaller proportions here, but our height was 12 new cases. Uh, that was uh, in, in March. And then since then, the cases have been more steady. And of course, in the last few days, you can see uh, this is, uh, you know, fewer than two is right here. And so uh, the last uh, three days, I believe it is uh, fewer than two cases in Jefferson County uh, going on the right trend line. Uh, the next county is Garland County, just picking out another one here in central Arkansas uh, area. 
South Arkansas. And here the top line is about 17 of new cases. Uh, this goes back to March 14th. Some days there were not any new cases. Uh, and you can see uh, toward the end, uh, since uh, about the last uh, week, uh, there's been the height of uh, five, about three cases here, two cases, and then it looks like one case uh, for each of those other days there. And so you can see in the different counties a different perspective in terms of uh, where they are geographically in terms of the spread as well. Uh, and this, uh, and I think that's all the counties I have there. Uh, thank you. And we've looked at a few other counties. The trend lines are really the same in terms of going uh, down in terms of the new cases, but uh, Dr. Smith and his teams examines that to that uh, level of detail. Uh, I did want to uh, comment uh, that I would have signed the executive order today creating uh, the working group on testing capacity in Arkansas. Uh, this is something that I've acknowledged from day one, uh, that we have to do more testing. Uh, we you know, have challenged in terms of our reagents and our supply line, uh, and it is getting better. Uh, and uh, uh, we've, but, but we need to c continue to grow, not just what we do in terms of contact tracing capability for testing, but also in terms of surveillance, where we can see a, where we are brought more broadly in the population in Arkansas. And so this is a, a clear objective I've had from day one, uh, acknowledging that we need to do more testing, and for that reason I've convened this uh, working group uh, of uh, testing uh, experts and officials and uh, doctors in the different uh, hospitals here in central Arkansas and other places that are doing testing. Uh, I hope that uh, through this we can have some short-term goals in order to enhance the testing quickly here in the state of Arkansas, determine what are the challenges in the supply chain so that we can uh, continue to address those, and then uh, thirdly, look long-term goals as well as uh, looking at next fall, we're still going to have a need for testing in Arkansas. Uh, we worry about this coming back whenever we get it uh, at the right spot uh, this season. We worry about the future, and so we want to continue to have that testing uh, capability. And we ha face a challenge in the state of Arkansas uh, with, and, and when you look at the new cases, uh, just prepare everybody that there's going to be no, more new cases in Cummins, and there's going to be more new cases in Forest City uh, Federal Correctional Institute in coming days. Uh, we understand that. We're doing that level of testing because it's critical to, for the uh, health and safety of the, of the inmates that are there, but also the staff, uh, as well as the uh, community. So we're continuing to uh, do that, but we'll see that uh, continued increase in the numbers in uh, the next couple of days, I would expect. With that, I invite Dr. Smith uh, to come and make uh, his comments. Thank you, Governor. Um, I will give uh, some details on the on the numbers that the governor shared in just a moment. But I, I want to give my perspective as a, a public health physician and an epidemiologist, sort of the three pieces of good news that the uh, governor shared. Uh, the first is that um, uh, that our uh, if you take out the positives from the from the correctional system, our numbers of new cases are going down. Last week we were looking at uh, you know consistently about 70 a day, and now we're looking at uh, on average uh, about half that. So that's a good sign uh, that we're um, that we're hopefully uh, on the downswing in terms of community transmission of COVID-19. That's very, very encouraging for me. Uh, the second is that uh, you know, the governor showed the different counties, and these counties were selected because they're the ones that have uh, more than 100 cases. Um, and you can see that each of them has a, a little bit of a different pattern. And then there's a lot of noise, ups and downs, but none of them are on an upward trend. So we don't have any you know, I would be concerned if the state was doing well, but we had some hot spots that were uh, that were on the upward 
upward trend. And then the third is although these numbers uh, from Cummins are alarming, um, uh, once you know who's positive, who's negative, who's exposed, who's not exposed, uh, a prison sit setting is probably the ideal setting to control an outbreak because you can segregate people and you can restrict their movements. Their movements are restricted just by the nature of that, uh, of that setting. So having um, this number of individuals in a prison um, is uh, easier to control than if we had that same number out in the community. Let me go ahead and go over those numbers that the governor shared with a little bit more detail. Uh, as he mentioned, we've had 304 new cases of which 262 were from the Cummins unit. Uh, so our total, total case count is 2,227. Of those, 1,375 are active cases. Uh, those include, uh, of the total cases, those include 249 healthcare workers, that's five more than yesterday. They include 135 uh, nursing home residents, uh, that's um, up seven from yesterday. We now have 29 uh, nursing homes where we have active uh, investigations going on. We currently have 86 hospitalized, that's a net decrease of seven. We've had seven uh, new hospitalized, but we've had 14 move out of the hospital. We have 27 currently on a ventilator, that's up three from yesterday. We have 43 deaths, which is one more than yesterday, and we have 809 recovered. That's 60 more uh, than we had yesterday. In terms of those um, nursing home facilities, of the seven new positive residents, um, three were um, at a facility in Batesville, uh, two at Willow Bend, uh, one at uh, Randolph County Nursing Home, and one at the village at Valley Ranch. Uh, we've also had um, an increase of um, four new nursing home workers, and uh, those were one each at Waters of White Hall, um, Alley Health and Rehab, uh, Crest Park of Wynn, and the village at Valley Ranch. Now, the big update is really from uh, the, uh, the Cummins unit. Um, as of 10 o'clock last night, we had a total of 670 um, inmates who tested positive, and we've had at least uh, 10 of the staff. Um, we are finished testing the inmates, um, uh, although we don't have all of those results uh, resulted in, in our system yet, um, but we are uh, testing staff now to make sure we don't miss any staff. So we may have additional staff uh, tomorrow we may have some additional inmates uh, as you can imagine we had quite a few results come in uh, by fax last night we had uh, our team working to sort those out uh, really late into the night and early this morning and uh, with that um, I'll go ahead and conclude my report and turn it back over to the governor Clearly this is a health care challenge force in Arkansas with a virus that is highly contagious and uh, does kill people. Uh, and so we're addressing it in that fashion. Uh, but it's also an economic challenge for our state. And for that reason, uh, I created the uh, Economic Recovery uh, ta Working Group, or excuse me, Task Force. And I've asked uh, Stuart Walton to lead that. Uh, Stuart is a entrepreneur, he's an innovator. He's in the hospitality industry, and he's the right one to uh, uh, be chair of this. We have about 40 of our good citizens across Arkansas that are engaged in a multitude of different industries involved in this. We had our first uh, uh, task force meeting today uh, led by uh, Stuart Walton, and I wanted him to come and give a report as to uh, that meeting and the direction we're going. Stuart? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Governor. I want to know where I can get a mask like yours, because mine's a little less flashy. Uh, but it's a privilege to be here and to support the uh, state of Arkansas. As the Governor said, just this morning we assembled uh, a good number of Arkansans representing industry, communities, religious institutions from across the state. 
We initially created uh, three committees uh, led by uh, secretary, uh, cabinet secretaries from the state of Arkansas. Uh, who will uh, further divide and, uh, and take on the important work of this task force. Secretary Stacy Hurst will lead the Committee on Tourism, Community, and Health Care. Secretary Mike Preston will lead the Committee on Commerce. And Secretary Wes Ward will lead the Committee on Agri Agriculture, Grocery, and Education. Informed by Dr. Smith and the work of the Department of Health, the task force is working hard to develop an initial set of recommendations for Arkansas by May 4th, which I believe all you know is the uh, date the governor set to, to, to begin uh, reopening. Subsequent to that, our tentative plan is to produce an interim report by the end of May and then a final report from the committee uh, by the end of June. And now in addition to the tactical uh, recommendations that we plan to, to report and, and uh, present to the governor from time to time, Committee is really going to be also focused on uh, a strategic set of recommendations for businesses and industry across Arkansas that will really help us uh, thrive in the recovery and uh, far into the future. I'm looking forward to the work ahead. Again, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Hey, Governor, you, got a, uh, you showed a, the graph yesterday that showed Arkansas was about 60 to 90 tests per 1,000. Do you know exactly how that was calculated? Because looking at just the raw numbers, less than 1% of the state has been tested. So it, to me, it just doesn't seem to add up. Uh, very good question. I actually uh, brought this out here today just so people will see it again. Uh, that's what I think you're referencing that I showed yesterday. And this was uh, taken from the uh, briefing from uh, the White House and their uh, COVID-19 uh, ta uh, task force. And this, uh, as you look at it, does strike you that it's not referring to actual tests that are being done. Uh, and it appears that it could be speaking of capacity. And it cites as the sources uh, uh, four different uh, uh, commercial lab companies uh, that are in the supply chain for Arkansas and it refers to tests per month per 1,000 people by state. Uh, so yes, as I've indicated always before, uh, we don't have sufficient tests in Arkansas. We need to do more. Uh, this uh, does seem to go against that grain. The only explanation I can see is it might be referring to capacity that somehow the uh, labs are referring to. Uh, and so uh, we have a lot of different data points that we share here. This is one. And uh, obviously, uh, we acknowledge that we've got to do a lot more in testing, and uh, uh, this does not reflect that. That issue, um, do you have a certain number of tests you want to get to, um, and also any target in terms of positive cases that you want to get to before May 4th, like number of positives per day? Or uh, we haven't set that specific uh, guideline. Of course, we have. Uh, the uh, guidelines that the White House provided for gating as to what you need to look at in terms of criteria for phase one. Uh, there's a number of them that we meet uh, very quickly. There's a couple that uh, we want to make sure they fit Arkansas and we're going to, and those are guidelines and they've made it clear that the states can uh, use their own judgment as to what is needed. So we'll work uh, with Dr. Smith and and the two teams together, the economic uh, team and the healthcare team, and uh, try to come up with the uh, right judgment for May 4th. Uh, you know, in terms of the testing itself, uh, that's part of what we're going to go through with our working group this afternoon with our testing experts in the room together. Uh, I've done some uh, brief uh, checking with a lot of hospitals around the state, a number of them. And uh, it, it appears to me that we've set a, uh, that actually the demand has decreased for testing. In other words, people who are lining up and saying we need a test are fewer today than they were a week ago and two weeks ago. And so they actually have a, uh, some inventory of tests, uh, ki test kits in their hospitals that uh, are available and I want to be able to push to to uh, look at those and see how we can utilize those 
in a broader way. Now, Dr. Smith reminds me, as well as the hospitals, that uh, we have to make sure that we have the testing capacity uh, for our contact tracing, but also as we allow patients to come back to hospitals for uh, uh, different procedures, we want to test some of those. We have to have some inventory of testing capacity. But uh, I think we can uh, do more and uh, uh, be ready for uh, some recommendations in that regard. Did you say Arkansas is in its peak right now? Well, it, it, if you look at the number of cases, uh, I hope we're at our peak and ready to go down. Uh, including the prison population, because these are really some escalating high numbers that we've seen the last couple of days. Uh, so I do hope that we're at the peak and ready to go down. Uh, but like I said, tomorrow we're going to have more cases because the uh, uh, tests are still going to continue to be done in the prison systems. And uh, as one leads to another, we will do more testing as needed. Uh, and so you've got to look at both uh, that peak statewide, but also I think in fairness to the state, uh, you know, you, you've got to look at where we are in Pulaski County and Garland County and Benton and Washington County and South Arkansas in terms of their trend line because these are, in the prison environment, it is a, a secluded area that uh, is more contained and so you've got to look at it at both levels. Uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, the peak, again, I just hope that we uh, uh, have reached it. but next couple of days we'll probably see our cases go up a little bit. Yes? Uh, Governor, this is Keith Percy with 439. All right. Uh, quick question for you. As you mentioned, the prison population. Uh, I understand a lot of this is filed by civil rights lawyers accusing your administration of inadequate measures to prevent COVID-19 transmission, illness, and death in the state as far as correctional facilities. How do you respond to the allegations and what measures are you well, I just uh, was handed that uh, lawsuit uh, moments before I came in here, so I haven't uh, read it in detail. Uh, I did scan through the back on where they asked for relief, and one of them was that we test uh, inmates whenever uh, they need it. Well, we've gone beyond that uh, with our inmate population at at Cummins because, uh, you know, Dr. Smith and his team has been there and provided more testing for the inmates in Cummins than is available in the general population because we're trying to uh, curtail it. We're trying to know exactly where we stand in that prison environment. So we'll look at that, but uh, I have uh, full confidence in uh, Dr. Smith and his team working with uh, Secretary Kelly uh, that they're going to extraordinary lengths to uh, make sure the inmates are having the uh, proper uh, health protocols uh, in that environment. I'm back to the table for a question. Yes. Uh, Governor, do you have a plan on when you might open salons, barbershops, what phase that might be in? Uh, the, the questions in reference to salons and barbershop. One, the demand is great. I'm hearing a lot from the public on that. And uh, that's uh, uh, something that uh, one, uh, Stuart Walton and his group are going to be looking at in terms of what uh, the uh, small business owner that has a barber shop or salon, what kind of protective measures and health care measures do they believe they can put into place. Obviously, uh, Dr. Smith then will be reviewing that with public health team. So that's what we're going to be working on the next uh, couple weeks as to one, whether we are in a position in terms of our uh, data. Uh, that that is a good measure to take. And then secondly, we will look at it in terms of what kind of uh, protective measures can be in place. So that is work to be done, and uh, we'll see uh, uh, where we land on that. Yes, ma'am. So um, I wanted to get a total on the infections at Cummins. Uh, would it now be around 900? The total that we have for inmates as of 10 o'clock last night was uh, 670. And I'm not sure how many more would be added to that, but I think probably some. In terms of the staff, we have uh, uh, at least 10 who have tested positive, but we are in the process of testing many more. So I'm not sure how many we'll add 
in terms of the staff, but we've really tested all the inmates that we're planning on testing at this point. We were at 600 yesterday, which is why I asked. Right, so we're at 670. Uh, 670, because the numbers that came in were from Cummins. Now remember, some of those were, most of those were from yesterday. The, we, we, we didn't have all those in the system. Um, uh, remember only 118 of the, of the tests from yesterday were from Cummins. So what you're seeing added today are, are tests that were done yesterday. And some of the test results we'll report tomorrow will be the ones that have come in uh, overnight, not yet entered into the system. Been released from any of the other? You said you were going to look at that on a case by case, Governor, with the uh, other inmates who might be um, close to close to leaving and in ill health. Uh, well, I recited yesterday, or maybe it was Sunday, uh, a, you know, some categories of inmates that the parole board had already acted upon, uh, but in terms of of the criteria that I gave them to look at of nonviolent, non-sex offenders, and inmates that are scheduled to be released within the next six months. Uh, that number is what they're looking at. That will be a longer process because you're looking at uh, well over a thousand of those. And, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, as they look at those, they will have to be looking at those from a public safety standpoint as well. And so uh, that's a process that they'll go through. I have no additional statistics for you. Not that I'm aware of. Where's, I was curious, uh, where is the, who are you hearing the most from on just opening things up and relaxing the restrictions? Is there a particular industry group? Is it, is it a reflection of who ended up on the task force? Uh, no, no, it, it, we tried to be all inclusive in the task force. Uh, and uh, so that reflects all of Arkansas because, you know, in Arkansas, we didn't close our retail shops. But some retail shops closed because customer demand was so low uh, that they closed on their own. And so the, what uh, uh, Mr. Walton is charged with is not just figuring out ways that we can re-engage and open some of the businesses that are closed like the restaurants and and others uh, but also how do you reinvigorate and build uh, customer confidence uh, in our retail shops so they feel safe and in going into those again uh, because some of them just had a reduced demand and so uh, these are you know, steps that we have to take one at a time uh, to be able to get there. In terms of, and Stuart, do you want to comment on this, what, what you've heard in terms of demand or Dr. Smith? Because we're getting pressure from everybody. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's obviously the self-employed salon owners uh, that uh, they have not got their uh, pandemic unemployment uh, payments yet. So they're out there struggling, and this is how they make their livelihood. But it's also not just them. The demand is from the the customer you know it's from when can I go get my hair done again and so yeah there's pressure there uh, but there's also you know great risk we want to make sure it's safe and so uh, that's what we're trying to balance uh, you know beyond that uh, you know it is some of the small entrepreneurs that have businesses out there that uh, the restaurants particularly you you hear from but they're all you know actually very reasonable and understand that uh, the need for what we've done, but they do want to have a path forward. When are we going to get to it? How long do we have to go without a paycheck? How long do we have to go without a revenue stream? Do we need to close up our business permanently or are we going to have a chance? And they're entitled to that kind of plan in the future to the extent we can give it to them under the current health challenges. Do you have anything else to add there, Nate? We have our group actively looking at all those areas. Uh, on the um, uh, president's opening up America again, uh, some of these businesses like the salons and barbershops, because they involve really fairly close proximity, physical proximity between people, they're not a phase one activity. But we will look and see if there are ways that we can uh, do that safely, uh, maybe uh, 
arrange that uh, those, uh, you know, whether it's uh, wearing masks or um, uh, or physically distancing, if there's ways that we can start those uh, businesses back uh, sooner than that. But I'm also hoping that when we enter phase one, if we do it correctly, we continue to do all these things that have got our numbers down to this point, that we'll continue to see a drop in our number of cases. And uh, in 14 days, we'll have met uh, gating criteria to enter phase two. And if we do phase two correctly and continue the uh, the physical distancing, all these other things that have brought us success so far. If we can continue to be disciplined uh, to do those things uh, and we continue to see a drop in cases, then we can go into phase three and we can continue to add additional businesses safely. Let's, uh, let's go remotely. Is there another question remotely? Governor, we're only with THB 11. Um, I'm curious to how frustrated you are with the White House right now after getting a map like that and um, so what's your frustration level as you head into this uh, working group meeting with the test folks? Well, I take some responsibility for that. I mean, I probably should have called the White House and looked at that a little bit more closely, but as you know, I, I like to uh, share data points as I receive those uh, and, uh, and so I'll take responsibility for that uh, in terms of the White House. Uh, uh, I am curious as to exactly their source for that, and so we'll be communicating with them to get a little bit more understanding of, of uh, where they're coming from on that. I do think they were talking about capacity, and it's probably a little bit of, of, uh, of differences there. Their view in capacity versus our, de our, our, our view of reality, and so uh, uh, it's it's just a continued communication uh, opportunity with the White House. What do those numbers look like in terms of reality? Like what's our capacity in those terms? Capacity for testing? Yeah. Uh, let, let me put it this way. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll check with the hospital. I check with a small hospital. I'll actually tell you, Gravit Hospital. Uh, I happen to be from Gravit, so I thought I would call the Gravit uh, Hospital that goes by Ozark Community Hospital now, the name. And uh, they, uh, you know, they have uh, 500 uh, test kits. So they have the capacity for 500 tests in this small rural hospital, and we were not aware of that. I was not aware of that. And, and so uh, they were able to acquire some of that testing capacity on their own. And so, uh, you're asking what the inventory is and the ability. You have to go hospital by hospital as to where they are and uh, what they've been able to acquire on their own, uh, as well as uh, their relationship with their commercial lab provider. You know, like Gravit Hospital has a commercial lab provider that they're working with and they send it off for testing and they come back, but they've got a capacity for 500 tests and I challenged them and I said, well, what if we reduce your inventory by 50%? Uh, that way we could do 250 more surveillance tests out there or broaden the criteria. Dr. Smith's going to get upset with me here real soon, I know, but, uh, but you know, that's the kind of information that, uh, you know, uh, we have to try to pull together with our working group to know what we can expand out there, and that makes sense because you don't want to test everybody. Uh, you want to test those that are either symptomatic or somehow expanded a little bit broader than that, and we'll be working on what's the right criteria for that. Do you know when the CDC will be returning to Four City this week? Uh, uh, I'm going to let uh, uh, Dr. Smith bring you up to date on Four City. I think he's got more, re more recent information. Certainly. I met with the second CDC team this morning and they're preparing to go out, I believe, today or tomorrow. Uh, what they're trying to do is, is prepare everything that they need to go on site because they have a plan for testing. And uh, we've discussed their plan and uh, what they will do when they get that information. Uh, and so there's a lot of planning that goes into it so they can hit the ground running, do the tests, get the results quickly, and then make a decision what the next steps are. Are you concerned with their plan? whether their plan is adequate for the city? I think their initial plan is, is, is adequate to give them the information they need. It may give them information that tells them they need to do more testing, though. 
uh, and we shared with them extensively our experience at the Cummins unit and the really aggressive uh, uh, approach that we've taken there. And uh, I really agree with the governor in terms of testing, but I think we need to lean into testing using our capacity in areas where we can gather the most actionable information. Um, we need to do some testing amongst low-risk uh, groups as well, but um, uh, for example, the UAMS, they have their teams that go out to different parts of the, of the state and they're testing people who have symptoms. In some cases, they may pick up one or none. Um, that's important information to know, but um, uh, it doesn't mean that you need to keep testing in areas where, where you're getting zero cases. Uh, is there a, another question remotely? Yeah, this is from Carson. Well, let's go to the one who hasn't asked a question yet. Yeah, this is Veronica Ortega with Five News. I have a question about unemployment. A couple of weeks ago, it was mentioned that there would be upgrades made to handle the increased volume of unemployment claims. My question is, are those upgrades working because there are still people waiting outside of unemployment offices in long lines because they can't get a hold of someone over the phone and they keep getting errors when they try to file a claim online? Uh, the IT system has been upgraded. Uh, they've processed uh, close to 150,000 claims, and so 150,000 people have successfully navigated uh, the process to uh, get their unemployment claims. Uh, sometimes the uh, uh, person going on the system might make an error, might enter wrong data, or uh, there could be some other uh, glitch there. Uh, the call center is operational. Uh, the hours have been extended, so uh, I would suggest that uh, they give our office a call. Uh, we'll be glad to troubleshoot it for them if, uh, if there's a, an issue there. We want to be helpful, uh, but we've got our call center. Uh, we also have uh, the online capability, and of course we're trying to avoid the necessity of having to go into the Workforce Services office, uh, and hopefully these other systems will work. Uh, I'll have to have uh, Secretary Preston uh, come back sometime and give a, a more recent update, uh, but I know they're working very hard to make sure all those claims are processed. And Governor, I'm just curious, from page 14 again, uh, Walmart has required employees to wear face masks. Uh, have you taken another look at requiring the same of Arkansans to wear face masks in public as opposed to just recommending it? Actually, I've, I've given that thought, but uh, uh, I like where we are right now because the people of Arkansas have been so responsive and responsible uh, in terms of their own uh, safety. They, they put, when they can't socially distance, they wear their mask. Uh, I think Walmart has certainly set a good example, uh, not requiring customers, although we're suggesting that be the case, but they're their personnel wearing masks, that's a, uh, that's a way that they run their business, which is to make sure that the customer is first, uh, that the customer uh, is confident in uh, meeting all the uh, public health requirements. So I applaud them for that. Uh, I think that you'll see other uh, retailers and uh, industry leaders uh, do the same. Uh, I expect, and here this is important to remind everybody again, whether you're in phase one, phase two, or down the road, uh, the social distancing, uh, the protective measures of wearing masks when you can't socially distance uh, is a guideline that we want to continue with here in Arkansas. So the guideline is working, and uh, I don't see us uh, arresting people because they're not, but I do expect them to be wise and prudent. Uh, on the table, I let, let's come back to the table here. Any? Uh, the, uh, the Washington University of Washington Health Institute for Health Metrics, they were giving June 22nd, I think, is the day when Arkansas could safely start lifting some of these restrictions. I was wondering what you think about their projections. Well, uh, you know, I think uh, as much about their modeling today as I did a month ago when they were saying we were going to have uh, thousands of hospitalizations and uh, uh, and, and, and 
you know, our peak was going to be uh, out, out the roof. Now, I'm not treating that with disrespect, but uh, their modeling adjusts every day. And I do remember whenever their peak was April 24th and it was April 29th, and then it was in May. And, and as we flatten, as we change things in Arkansas, their, their modeling changes a little bit. I know that uh, Dr. Smith has paid close attention to it. I wanted you to uh, comment on that as well. Certainly the uh, April 17th adjustment to the IHME model um, has our peak resource utilization at April 30th, uh, but their new uh, addition in there about July, June 22nd, um, that was based on uh, getting down to one case per million, uh, which would be, for Arkansas, three cases in the entire state. Um, I don't think we have to wait till then before we reopen our economy. We certainly have the um, the case uh, uh, case follow-up and contact tracing capability to uh, manage a lot more than three cases in the entire state. All right, we'll we'll take two more questions, one remotely and one at the table. Is there a question remotely? Uh, I was wondering, as Pete Corsi again, um, given that the, the, the exports are primarily agriculture, uh, agricultural, and in light of the coronavirus outbreak, that processing plants in other parts of the country, uh, I was wondering what steps have you taken to ensure food security and protection of processing plant workers here in Arkansas? I want to make sure I understood the question. It's sort of going in and out, and somebody might have to help me. But are you asking about the protection of uh, uh, workers in? Uh, processing plants in our agricultural uh, community? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, well, first of all, uh, the, we have, I believe it's over 60 uh, processing plants in Arkansas, from beef to poultry, and uh, they all understand how vital they are to the supply chain. So they are being a very aggressive in taking uh, precautions in their own facility. And, and so we've been fortunate that we haven't had an outbreak. I think we had one positive case uh, that was dealt with and they're back in operation. Uh, but they know the risk that's involved and so they're you know, doing uh, temperament, uh, temperature uh, measurements, they're doing a screening of their employees, uh, they're putting in their protective gear and uh, the social distancing and the cleansing. Uh, and so. I know that uh, the health department has put out some uh, guidelines for them, and uh, I know that they're working very hard to do that and to keep their places safe for their workers. Uh, all right, so we'll take two questions here. Uh, um, you first, and then Well, Jeff. so who on the task force would be representing people like uh, the workers at the chicken plants or unionized people or nonprofits or women and children. Who on your task force is representing those sorts of people? Well, it was intentionally to put in the industry leaders and the associations of the, of the employers is what we were looking at. So that's the focus of the uh, Economic Recovery Task Force are those that create the jobs, that create the businesses. Uh, it is important to listen to each of those that you mentioned in terms of their health and safety, and uh, that really falls in the Department of Health uh, guidelines and that they provide. Jay? Uh, what are some of those criteria that you want to see to go from phase one into phase two, or is there maybe just a length of time that you want to see uh, pass over? Well, let's get through phase one. And, uh, and then uh, we just want to stay on the right trajectory. We want to make the good judgments. Uh, and it's based upon, first of all, the health of our citizens. And, uh, and then secondly, the health of our economy. Let's, we're just focusing on phase one. I want to invite uh, Stuart to come and make a comment uh, just on any cleanup. And then Dr. Smith also might have something on there. Uh, Stuart, you want to have a closing word there? Um, thank you. And, uh, you know, just to touch on your question, we've got uh, religious leaders on the task force and uh, we've got a few folks uh, from education as well. And uh, we'll be sure to also reach out to people who are not on the task force 
uh, to some of the constituents that you mentioned, and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, and you know, as far as businesses to open first, I think it's obvious that I need a haircut, <laughs> so I'm squarely uh, in that camp, probably with the governor as well. Um, but we're excited to get underway. We're going to approach this with uh, with a lot of focus. Uh, we'll be precise. We'll be prompt, and we're looking forward to getting this going. In terms of looking at our progression from phase into phase one, two, three, really we're going to be looking looking in two ways. One is sort of a, a broad, continue to look at our uh, positivity rates, see, looking at our number of new cases. As long as that's continuing to trend down, um, then we can move from phase one to phase two to phase three. Um, if uh, these activities, though, cause an increase in cases, then we need to pause or maybe even uh, take a step back. Um, so the gates uh, the gating criteria for each of these phases is basically the same. If uh, you make a change and two weeks later you're still having a decreased number of new cases, um, then, then you can go on and make some additional, additional changes. In addition to that sort of general looking at the situation, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing is taking a spotlight and looking at areas. Uh, my, my goal is to, is to find every every infection, every case that's out there. I don't want any pockets of infection that, that we don't know about. So, for example, at Cummins, we've been very aggressive shining a bright spotlight on that so we know where all the cases are. Uh, if we see evidence of that elsewhere, we'll do the same. So we'll be aggressively managing these uh, outbreak investigations, and if they can be contained and they don't spread into the community, they don't necessarily slow us down in what we're doing out in the general community. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.